Uh, before we get started, let me just ask you to pray with me, and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you so much for revealing yourself as you really are, and thank you for making known the, the secrets of your heart and your mind that we could never have known if you'd never told us. Thank you for giving us clear access to your greatness and your majesty. And Lord, you are a great God and there is no one like you among the gods. And we know that even to, to pray in this way is to pray in the way that the psalmist prays when he compares you to the other gods, which are obviously non-existent. You are distinct from all the other gods because you alone are the only true God, but Lord, we know that we are so prone as man, we are so prone to create other gods and to be compelled by other motives and to be consumed and concerned about other things that would actually govern how we live and how we think and what we do. And so, Lord, I pray that this series, as we look to your word, that you would grab hold of our hearts and minds in a powerful way. You would impress upon us in a new way, in a fresh way, your greatness, your power, your holiness, your majesty. God Almighty, we, we come to you this morning just realizing that the very fact that we can come into your presence, that we sinful creature could even come to your throne and could even imagine with the, the audacity that we could come and, and ask you for a favor is an overwhelming prospect. And what we would ask you for this morning is that you would increase our fear of you. And what we ask for this series is that you would cause our hearts to tremble at your word. And that you would cause us to be consumed with a fear of offending you and that a true fear of you would cause us to cling to you and would drive us to you for, for help and for guidance and that the thought of you would govern everything about us. And so, Lord, we're asking a lot and we acknowledge that we're doing so very quite boldly and we would be the most pitiable creatures to do this without your invitation. Thank you for inviting us to come to your throne room, seeking grace and help in our time of need, and perhaps never could we have needed more help than when we approach your word to learn what it means to fear you and to understand the fear of you. And so we ask all of this, Lord, um, knowing, as, as we will see in your word, knowing that if we fear you, it's, it's for our good, and we actually get all of the gain. But our motive for praying this this morning, Lord, is just simply that you would get the glory that you so richly deserve. You are the greatest thing, being, in existence. And if everything, if every atom and every molecule, every will and every desire and every thought and every intention of all your creation thought about you rightly and revered you appropriately and esteemed you in a way that would be proper and fitting. This would not be strange. This should not be something foreign. This should just simply be the way that it is. And so, Lord, it's just tragic if your creatures, let alone your children, would ever think about you in a way that's not befitting of your greatness. And so we just pray this morning that this series would certainly turn our hearts toward you in a proper way, that we would learn what it means to fear you and to fear you rightly. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm currently trying to help someone who has all the apparent symptoms of being consumed with the most grotesque sin imaginable. And if I start to talk about 
grotesque sins and grotesque forms of sin or symptoms of sin that take on a particularly dark um, appearance, you almost have to cover your children's ears and the adults' ears perk up and say, oh, what's, what would that be? What's, what in the world would he be talking about? But you don't have to cover your ears. What I'm describing is something that's much more sinister than the worst actions that you could possibly imagine. I'm talking about sin at the core of the being, and that would be thoughts about God that imagine him to be less than he is. Thoughts about God that imagine him to be less than he is. A.W. Tozer said it quite well. I've been a believer for about a year when I read his book, Knowledge of the Holy. And in the very first chapter, he says, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That is so true. What comes to your mind when you think about God, what fills that space in your soul as you regard God and as you consider who God is, That's the most important thing about you. There's nothing more important about you than your thought of God. How you regard him, how you esteem him, what you consider him to be, how the importance that you place on his desires, on his priorities, on his will. That's the most important thing about you. And we are um, way too, way too often, we... We think about God in a way that is less than he deserves. And we often imagine him to be something less than he has revealed himself to be. And this is the tragedy of of what it means when we don't fear God the way that we ought to. I'm titling this first part, The Domestication of God. The Domestication of God. God is uh, the greatest being. He's greater than we can imagine because our imagination is very finite. You know, when when philosophers talk about God being the greatest thing you can imagine, that falls woefully short of what the Bible says about God because the Bible reveals a God who is infinitely beyond the greatest thing we can imagine. Our imagination is finite, and we often imagine him to be less than he's revealed himself to be. And so we are in desperate need of God to reveal himself for, our, for human beings to revere him rightly and to fear him rightly. And when we don't, I'm going to liken that and compare that to uh, a domestication of God. Taking something that is wild and ought not to live in your house, <laughs> otherwise it would be dangerous, and we often do that with God. I'm not necessarily a big fan of C.S. Lewis. I have... I've read a lot of C.S. Lewis, and I've read enough C.S. Lewis to have a lot of concerns about his theology. But I am, uh, but but he is a phenomenal writer, and uh, regardless of where he was at spiritually, uh, he's an incredible writer. And and um, and we did read uh, the Chronicles of Narnia books with our with our kids with with much theological editing. Um, we enjoyed that. I kind of enjoy that more than actually reading the book at times. But nevertheless, having had that caveat put out there, um, I do appreciate the picture of. Um, Susan first hearing about Aslan when she's talking to Mr. Beaver. And Aslan in the uh, Chronicles of Narnia series is the lion who is the, you know, the, the Christ-like figure in the story. And so Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. And I thought that was a helpful, a helpful capture of God. He's not safe. And as humans... We don't like feeling unsafe. We don't like being pressed and strained and stretched. And we like feeling like we're in control. And we like feeling like we will always be safe. And we like feeling like we will never have to give more than we want to give. And all of those desires will cause us to domesticate God. 
few years ago, I remember hearing about um, a story back in Florida. This was in South Florida. A 16-year-old girl was mauled by a 150-pound cougar in Miami-Dade County. She um, had to go to surgery for um, two hours. She had two hours of surgery to repair a large back, uh, a large gash in the back of her um, neck and her head, as this animal basically clamped down on her head and had her head in its in its jaws. And um, the Miami Herald uh, reported that it really was a miracle that she even survived the experience. Um, she was expected to make 100% recovery, and so it was just pretty, pretty remarkable that um, she was no, going to suffer no ill effects um, permanently. But you think about that kind of story, and you think about that kind of situation, and you think, wow, she escaped. Um, the cat's name, ironically, was Chaos, and um, you think, well, what? What do you expect is going to happen? It was a 150-pound cougar, and it was privately owned, and they were over at a friend's house cleaning out the cage. And you think, well, it's a cougar. In a less fortunate event, in 2006, a um, Bengal tiger owner was attacked and killed. Uh, 52-year-old Cynthia Lee Gamble her body was found in the, next to the 500-pound tiger's cage. And so the uh, authorities came, came and found the body, and then they euthanized the tiger, and they took it to the University of Minnesota Veterinarian Hospital for testing. I read that story on it, for testing. I think they're going to find out that it was a 500-pound Bengal tiger. It does not make a good house, house pet. And I certainly don't want to... D diminish or uh, just, you know, treat in a superficial way a tragic story like this. But it really does illustrate something's wrong if we just take a 500-pound tiger and domesticate it and turn it into our house cat. The, the consequences in this case were fatal. And even worse, even worse, infinitely worse, of an eternal spiritual variety are, are the consequences of domesticating God Almighty. When you look at the accounts of people who have met God, who have been around God, it's very consistent. We'll look at it, we'll look at in the next coming weeks, we'll look at a few of these examples that will come up, but just even without turning here, for the sake of time, just picture with me in your mind some of these familiar stories. And if, if they're not super familiar, I'll try to describe it enough to, so that if you went back to those texts, you could, you could see exactly what I'm thinking of. But think of the famous incident, incident uh, on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, God says, we're going to make you a nation. This is what it's going to look like for you to be my, a nation who honor me and for you to be those who worship God. I'm distinct from other gods. You're going to be distinct from other people. So here's the covenant. And he starts to lay that out. Exodus 20. He's preparing them at the end of 19, at the beginning of 20, to come up to the mountain, and they're going to be around the bottom of the mountain, and they're going to hear the, the, the beginning of the giving of the law. When God shows up on Mount Sinai, you have a phenomenon that looks like um, earthquakes, smoke billowing out of the top of the mountain. Uh, the mountain is shaking and quaking, and a barrier is put around the bottom of the mountain. Moses goes up on the mountain. God says, go back down and tell him to not come up the mountain. He's like, I already told him that. Well, go back down and tell him again. So he comes back down and tells him again, don't come up here. And they're like, why would we ever go up there? They are scared. They are terrified. Moses goes back up to the mountain, and then uh, he gives them the Ten Commandments. After the Ten Commandments, he comes back down, and um, he tells them about what God had said. And he has to say, don't be afraid. God has revealed himself to you so that you can fear him. Don't be afraid. Fear. Don't be afraid. Fear. The natural response of human beings seeing some sort of phenomena of the manifestation of God's very presence is a terrifying prospect. And no one has had that experience without being afraid. But Throughout the scriptures, human beings have had that experience 
and not feared. You can't be around something like that and not be terrified. The human beings are scared spitless. Their knees are quaking. Their knees are knocking. They just are, they just, it, it's like a paralyzing effect. When Ezekiel, in chapters 1 through chapter 11, you have this uh, appearance of God and the, the appearance of glory and a likeness of the representation of the image of God showing up in these visions. And he is just sapped of strength and he has to be empowered supernaturally by the Spirit to even stand on his feet. Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees God, and he just falls down, and he's undone. Judges 6, Gideon sees God and thinks, I'm going to die. Judges 13, Samson, Samson's parents, uh, Manoah and his wife, they see God, and they say, we're going to die. And his wife says, well, I think we would have already died died if, if, if we hadn't died right now. And he accepted our offering, so somehow we survived. John, in Revelation 1, falls down like a dead man. He has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to even stand on his feet to receive the revelation, which is the book of Revelation. You know, God's not safe. God is more significant, and he's more majestic, and he's more uh, awful, full of awe, than anything finite, fallen human beings can imagine. And if we had a phenomena of experiencing some manifestation in creation of his personal presence, we would all be afraid. That's just natural. What's supernatural for sinners is to fear. Being afraid might have a manifestation of shaking, quaking knees, but being but fearing God is a virtue. So I want to ask this question this morning. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a, a, a definition of the fear of the Lord. We're just going to dive into the scriptures and say, well, what is the fear of the Lord? Because the fear of the Lord is not, we don't want to water it down. And in a few weeks, I'll talk about that. We don't want to just make the fear of the Lord some sort of, you think highly of him. You just esteem him. That's true. Esteeming God highly is part of fearing the Lord. But let's not water down the term. The term is a perfectly good term. I love the translation, fear. Because fear is not less than fear. And so I appreciate synonyms that we might use to to, to flesh that out as we grapple with what the Bible reveals about this virtue of the fear of the Lord. But as we do that, we cannot make it less than fear. It it is actually a very real fear. Um, But it's not like a fear that would drive you away from God. It's a fear that drives you to God. And we're going to look at that. We're going to spend some time defining that and looking at what the scriptures say about that. But before we even get to the definition of what it actually is, I thought it might, hopefully I didn't make the wrong choice in this series to start with the domestication of God because I thought it might be helpful if we start with the fact that we are so prone to think too lightly of God before we go to the positive of what we ought to do, what what the virtue of fear of the Lord really is. So hopefully I didn't make the wrong choice, but that's the choice I made. So we're going to start with what does it mean to domesticate God? To think of God too lightly, to, to put him in a, in a box and to make him safer than he really is. Well, as I've been thinking about that, I thought it might be helpful to even look at the response of other beings to God. You know, domesticating God is such a tragic flaw and such a tragic sin, and it's actually, it's actually we, we can see how, how wicked it really is when we look at how, first of all, how the angels fear God. Think about this. How absurd is it for mankind to think less highly of God than we ought to when beings who are greater than us, greater in power, not greater in role, we're created in the image of God, they're not. We're, we're, we're the ones who were created to give dominion over the earth, they're not. But they have more, they're supernatural beings with greater power than human beings. They fear God. Look at Psalm 89. We're going to start in Psalm 89. 
And there's a text here that's super important and super helpful as we think about how, how just trying to put in the proper light how bad domesticating God really is. In Psalm 89, this is a, a very messianic psalm. You can read through it and you can recognize Ethan the Ezraite, who would have been a younger contemporary of David, um, is writing about the coming of the son of David and the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and um, the corporate seed and global rule, global reign, and um, the exaltation of, this, of the Messiah, the firstborn, the greatest of uh, the one who caused all creation to be created. And this is just loaded with so much um, messianic revelation. Well, what I want to focus on is verses 5 through 10. Psalm 89, verses 5 through 10. And notice... What the psalmist says here, Ethan the Ezraite writes in verse 5, The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. So there you have inanimate objects like the heavens praising God's wonders. They'll praise your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. Okay, so now, talking about the heavens, talking about um, the, 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 you know, above, you know, not the earth. He's describing where the angels would live. This is the heavens. And he calls them the assembly of the holy ones. Verse 6, for who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Obviously, the answer is no one. He doesn't answer it, but that's the implied answer. No one is comparable to the Lord. Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? Verse 6b translates this phrase, Sons of the mighty, in the Hebrew it's literally b'nai elim, uh, sons of God. Sons of God. And that's a, that's a phrase that's very often, both in Job and in Genesis, used of angelic beings, sons of God, as opposed to sons of men. And so the son of God is a supernatural being, and the son of man is a human being. Okay, so not that this is the point of Psalm 89, but that's helpful for us in our Christology when you get to the Gospels and Jesus calls himself the Son of God and the Son of Man. But for our purposes here, look at verse 6b. He's talking about this conglomerate group of cre creatures who are called the sons of God and they dwell in the heavens. Verse 7, a God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones. And awesome above all those who are around him. He's describing God Almighty in the presence of supernatural creatures. And together, those supernatural creatures have a relationship with God that's described as one of fear. And this is interesting. This is helpful. Because it's appropriate for those beings to fear God, and they're not even sinful. Have you ever thought about that? They're not even sinful. And it's only appropriate that holy angels in God's presence would fear him. This is a being unlike anything that an angel could ever imagine. Verse 8, O God, O Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea when its waves, waves rise. You still them. You yourself crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. And he goes on just to describe the power and the incomparable existence of this one, Yahweh God. The incomparability of God demands that we fear him. And this is true of holy angels. This is true of supernatural creatures more powerful than us who have not offended him in the same way that we have. This is profound. Holy angels fear God. Let me show you one more person who fears God. Christ, the Messiah, in Isaiah chapter 11, 
is revealed to be one who delights in the fear of the Lord. This should blow us away. To look at Isaiah 11 and to see the prophecy about Jesus Christ who would, to, who would be uh, coming to earth in 600 years, 600 plus years from Isaiah's prophecy. And he's telling us in chapter 11, there will be a shoot that springs forth from Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So this is a shoot, a branch, something that comes off of the line of Jesse. Jesse is obviously the father of King David. King David was given the promise of the seed. So the, the promise to reverse the curse and establish a reign of righteousness and to redeem humanity was tied to this promise from Eve and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, now David. And so now Isaiah 11, with all of that revelation in store as common knowledge to his audience, he says, by the way, there's going to be a shoot from Jesse. And they're like, yep. The Messiah, we got it, son of David, he's coming. We're expecting his arrival. He's an offspring of, of, of him. He's, he's going to be a descendant um, uh, from David. And it's interesting, if you skip forward to chapter, to verse, chapter uh, 11, verse 10, it says, in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. The root of Jesse. So in the same prophecy, he's talking about this Messiah who is an offspring of Jesse and the root of Jesse. So he, had, in some ways, he's the cause or an, an ancestor. In some way, he is a cause of Jesse's existence, and he is also dependent on Jesse by way of uh, generation. He comes out of Jesse's line. And so this is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the creator, who becomes man in the line of Jesse. And what does it say about him in verse 2? The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. From Isaiah's vantage point, he's saying when Christ comes, this is a clear revelation of Christ. He, he wouldn't have known Jesus of Nazareth, but he knew Christ. And he says, when Christ comes, he's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant. He's going to be a perfect son of David who doesn't need chastening for the first time in the line. And he's going to establish a reign of righteousness. And you know what he's going to be marked by? He's going to be filled with the Spirit. And you're going to see, for the first time, a human being who delights in the fear of the Lord perfectly. Fear of the Lord is perfect and appropriate and Fitting for the perfect Son of Man, Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Perfect holy angels fear him. Jesus Christ feared him and fears him. And we do not. This should just cause us to stagger. This should cause us to stop and say, what? really? This study has caused me to look at my life and look at my, my thoughts about God and my, my practice and the inclination of my will and how I live and how I conduct myself. And I've had to just pause and just tell the Lord, Lord, I have a lot of growing to do in this critical, critical category of fearing you. And I'm not presuming on you. Some of you I'm still getting to know. I just read my Bible and I know that you're in the same category. We all need to grow in the fear of the Lord. So to start with the domestication of God, I just want to look at a few ways that we domesticate God. The Bible is so helpful. God is so gracious to give us in his revelation Several ways that would expose how we are prone to domesticate God. And before I dive into a couple of these ways, we're going to look at two this morning, and uh, the third one will be next week. But before we look at these ways that we domesticate God, you know, it might be helpful to even think about it and compare us, us and I'm speaking now to, to us as a church family, to compare us to the pagan. 
A pagan is going to just disregard the fear of the Lord. A pagan is going to have no desire to even think or consider how terrifying, how unique, how awe-inspiring and awful God is in his praises. I still like the old King James in Exodus 15. Awful in praises. Awful in praises. I mean, God is just so incomparable and so worthy of being feared. The pagan is going to have a glimpse of revelation or a glimpse of being around a Christian who fears God and says, I don't want anything to do with that. That is a huge inconvenience to the way I'm going to live my life. And it's just a total stiff arm when it comes to the fear of the Lord. And that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about when I say domesticating God. That's just a pagan having secular integrity, saying, I live, I'm the master of my own fate, I'm going to live for my own glory, and that's all I care about, and they just do that. What I'm talking about when I say the domestication of God, I'm talking about how we do that in a church context. The very subtle, the subtle ways that Christians are prone to put God in a box or we often make him more manageable or we often diminish how significant he must be in our thinking and we think about him in inappropriate ways. This is the domestication of God that's a very very accessible in a religious context. And so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about domesticating God. So there's a few ways. First of all, let's just, let, me just, let me just list them out. I have three that I listed out. Three ways that we domesticate God, and we're, hopefully we can finish the two of them this morning. First of all, we domesticate God by viewing him as needy. Viewing him as needy. Sometimes we reimagine God, uh, God in our own image, and we relate to God in such a way that we think that he's benefiting from us. That's a, that's a very common way in, in our, as we go about our, our, our routine in church life, that's a, that's a very common way we start to think about God in an inappropriate way. Uh, and we'll look at that, especially in Psalm 50 and Acts 17. Um, number two, we often mix our own desires with his. We often mix our own desires with his. See, the, the pagan isn't domesticating God by just, you know, trying to synchronize all of his desires with God's. He could care less about the, that's just a hassle. Why, why mix them? So in a religious environment, when we start thinking lightly or trivially about God, we start to actually mix our desires with God's desires and try to maintain both. And that's not going to work. And we'll look at that in Malachi chapter 1. In the third way... Is we view God as the dispenser of, of our personal benefit. We view God as the dispenser of our own good. And uh, that's, a quite off, that's quite common how we start to think about God in religious contexts. And we'll look at uh, the religious context of the nation of Israel from 2 Kings 17. That'll be, that'll be next week. So, how do we domesticate God? Well, we often view him as needy. Look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50, and there's, there's so many ways we could go, um, and I'm just going to look at Psalm 50, and then I'll, I'll make a quick comment about Acts 17, because this is, this is all too common. Psalm 50 is a very sober psalm. It's a heavy-hitting psalm. It's, it's pretty much a confrontation. It's a confrontation of Asaph to the nation, and the nation of Israel obviously has um, all of God's law, they have a custom and a habitual practice and a course and flow of the calendar year that revolves around doing what God has called them to do. So their life, by way of culture, is simply loaded with religious action and behavior. And Asaph comes along and says, you know what? You are going through your religious life imagining something less than God. Here's how the nation of Israel domesticated God. They reimagined God. They tried to recreate God in their own image. Look at verse 21. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Now, before we look at the rest of Psalm 50 and get some context and get some help from the context, just appreciate verse 21 for what it is. Asaph is confronting the nation because they, they are domesticating God. They're, this is way worse than a 500-pound Bengal tiger and putting him in your living room as a house cat. This is, 
thinking about God as though he was just like us. So God creates us in his image, and then in our wickedness, we are tempted, and we too often start to reimagine him in our own image. We start to think about God as though, well, if I were God, it would be like this. And we start to impose the way that we work and think and the priorities that we have, and we start to impose those on God. And we are domesticating him. We are making him like us. The nation's not being rebuked in this psalm for not obeying the law in the sense of not fulfilling the externals required by the law. That's important to recognize. The rebuke here is not, you think so lightly of God that you stop doing what I asked you to do. The problem is, they're going through external duty, and they're going through external behavior, but while they're carrying out these practices that are part of their custom, part of their culture, and required by the Torah, they're doing it in such a way that they're thinking about God as though God were like them. So now, let's go back to Psalm 50, and let's look at this context here. Just read through the psalm very quickly. Verse 1, the mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. May our God come and not keep silence. Fire devours before him, and it is very tempestuous around him. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. They were doing the sacrifices. And your burnt offerings are continually before me. They're still doing burnt offerings. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. Because every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of male goats? I mean, God has put them on their heels because they're sitting there doing these actions, and in their mind, they have now reimagined God to be like them, and they're sitting there thinking, when somebody does something for me that I've asked them to, I feel a little bit indebted to them, a little bit obligated to them, and um, yeah, I mean, this person did what I asked, so I should probably repay the favor. They're actually doing things for God, thinking God should... Repay the favor. They're offering these sacrifices and and they're performing for God in such a way that they are starting to feel entitled. They're starting to feel like, well, I've done these things for God. I mean, surely that means that fill in the blank. Whoa, stop right there. Have we just reimagined God to be something like us? That our performance would actually make him indebted to us? But God, didn't I obey this? But God, didn't I do this? And our obedience comes with an asterisk and a price tag, and we have expectations, and we feel entitled, and we think God ought to respond to us in a certain way when we're just, we just ought to do whatever he says, and regardless of how, how it goes for us. What does it possibly matter? And so Israel has now carried out these actions of obedience while recreating God in their own image. And they view him as needy, and they are expecting uh, certain results, and they, they, they believe that God ought to be impressed, and they believe that God has now benefited from them. <laughs> Whoops. God has never benefited from us. Isn't that a good reminder? This is one of the most subtle ways I think we can domesticate God in religious context, especially in a Bible preaching church. (laughs) What can you do for God? What can you do for God? Well, 
I can provide him a liability. I provide a massive liability. He's entrusted me with a wife. He's entrusted me with kids. He's in, called me to be a pastor. That's what I give to God. Big, massive chunk of liability. Whoops. But is there anything positive that we can do for God? Well, if we, if we avoid the temptation to domesticate him and to recreate him in our image, yes, verse 14 does give us a positive answer. Here's what God says we can do for him. Just offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Just say thanks. Pay your vows to the Most High God. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. You know the way that we honor a God like this? Not a God that we've recreated in our own image, but the God who's revealed himself in Scripture who has no need. He has no lack. He doesn't gain anything from us. If we ascribe to him glory, we're just saying things as they actually are because he's the God of glory and we have never made him more glorious. What do you do for a God like that? You simply say, here's my liability, here's my lack, here's my need. I'm going to leave it in your lap. Do something with it for your own glory and get glory for yourself. And he says, do that and you will honor me. Let me save you. Let me deliver you. That's it. That's it. It changes how we think about God, doesn't it? Verse 16, God says, but to the wicked, God says, what right... Have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. And we're going to see that come up again. So just by way of comment real quick, verse 17b. The relationship of people to God is identical to the relationship of people to his word. So when they disregard God and they disregard his word, those are, in, those are distinguishable, but they're inseparable. Nobody has ever regarded God rightly and feared God without trembling at his word. And nobody's ever trembled at his word without fearing God. And that'll come up again in the series. Verse 18. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you associate with adulterers. I mean, this is congenial approval. You let your mouth loose in evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. Now we get to our verse, and now we understand why he's saying that. The nation has thought that God was just like them. And they have gone through religious routine, and as they have performed these actions, and so now if I just applied it to us in the church, going moving from the nation of Israel to the church, we perform these actions in the church, and if we imagine that God is like us to some degree. We imagine that he's better off for our performance and that he has somehow gained because of what we've done. And we start to become entitled and we start to think that we are, have earned some sort of fruit or praise, esteem, or whatever we're after. And when we view God as needy, we actually begin to think that we are significant enough to benefit God and that he owes us. This is actually a natural way to think about God. And I want to quickly look at Acts 17 for a second. Look at Acts 17. You remember, this is Paul preaching at Athens. And so now you have Paul taking kind of the same reality that Asaph brought against the nation of Israel in a religious context. Paul brings that against the pagans uh, the pagan philosophers of Mars Hill in Acts 17. And in verse 24 and 25, he addresses that very reality. And it's interesting. This is a natural way that sinners are going to think about God. We are going to naturally domesticate God by reimagining him or recasting him in our own image and thinking about him in some way to be fashioned like us in some, in some way. And so Paul says this in verse 24. The God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Paul has to tell them, he's not served by human hands. He doesn't have any need. He doesn't have any lack. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. 
do not domesticate God by thinking of him as needy, by recreating him, reimagining him in our own image. When you do that, how do you know that you're doing that in a, in a church context? Just look for a sense of expectation and entitlement. If you feel let down because you, you've obeyed or you've worked hard or you see your labors in the church, mm, maybe not earning the appreciation or the praise or the applause that you wanted, now you know you're viewing God as needy and you're doing it for the wrong motive and you've domesticated God. Let's look at another one. Number two, a second way we domesticate God, mixing our own desires with his. Mixing our own desires with his. Let's go to Malachi chapter one. Malachi is just a, one of those profound books, um, and it, I'm very fond of it. I, 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 it's, it's one of the, probably the only minor prophet I've actually preached verse by verse, and the reason I was just so drawn to it was because it was so helpful for me, having grown up as an unbeliever in the church. And Malachi is confronting the religious hypocrisy of the nation. He's the last prophet before the intertestamental period. And it's, it's, it's also, it's, it kind of reads in a similar way to Psalm 50, honestly, because it's pretty heavy hitting. And Malachi just kind of takes it to the nation. And um, he has about six messages that compose this prophecy. And we're going to look at the second one here real briefly. Chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. Chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. And the question that Malachi is asking the nation is, do you despise God? And so for our purposes this morning, when I ask the question, how do we domesticate God? Well, Malachi gives us an answer here. And he says that one of the major ways that we can domesticate God is by mixing our own desires with his. So again, the pagan would not have any desire to have to mix the two. He doesn't have, to, he doesn't have the unfortunate complication of trying to mix his own desires with God's desires because he just does his own desires. But in a religious context, if we start to domesticate God and think of him less than he actually is, now we have the impossible task of trying to mix our desires with his. And the way that Malachi exposes the way that happens in a religious context is very, very helpful. This is a very edifying um, message that he preaches in verses 6 to 14. So, He's asking the question, do you despise his name? And the question he asks in verses 6 to 9 is, is he honored by your service? Is he honored by your service? Look at what he says. A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am father, where is my honor? And if I am master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name? Now, before we move on to that next question, notice what he does. God is obviously, Malachi is obviously revealing God's message. So God is just sitting there preaching a sermon to the nation, and they are despising him. They are domesticating him. They are making him smaller or less significant than he actually is. And the way that they're thinking about God is horrible, and they don't realize it. That's always the problem, isn't it? That we would actually be thinking less worthy thoughts of God than he's worth, and we would not know it. That's tragic. And so, how does God expose that? Well, he starts to compare the way they would regard somebody that they think highly of, the way that they esteem. And so, he says, a son honors his father, a servant his master. And so then, therefore, if I'm a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where is my respect? The point is, God is pointing out to them, you show me less honor than a father and less respect than a master. But they don't see it. They don't see that. God's clearly, he's he's putting his finger on a problem and they're blind to it. And so at the end of the verse, he points out that he he actually predicts their question. No doubt as they hear this revelation from Malachi, they're already asking the question and Malachi then says, as he's saying, thus saith the Lord, but you say, how have we despised your name? So they're sitting there thinking, yeah, right, how have we despised your name? And then Malachi actually says that, and he just speaks it out while they're thinking it. It's just profound revelation here. Verse 7. Here's the answer to that question that you're asking that you didn't voice, but God knew that you asked it. Verse 7. 
you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? And then God answers that question that they were asking but didn't voice. In that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. Now they're probably still saying, that's the point. How are you saying we despise the table? Verse 8. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Now that's an important question right there. Is he honored by your service? The technique that Malachi uses to expose this is to then ask them the rhetorical question, would you treat the person that you have the greatest esteem for this same way? And in the NAS, when it says um, in eight, the middle of verse 8, why not offer it to your governor? When he asks that question, the Hebrew kind of has a, it's like a, more like an entreaty. And maybe, even a, maybe, maybe a better way to translate it would just be, please, offer it to your governor. So God kind of puts them on their heels a little bit and says, okay, here's how you're treating me. Just go ahead and treat the person whom you put highest significance on, treat them that way. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, whatever that would be. Sports figure, president, I don't know. A pastor comes over, somebody who you have respect for. But would you treat them would you be concerned to treat them the way that you treat God? Now, that's a very direct application because we're talking about sacrifices. And what's the motive when you have a sacrifice and you're thinking, well, okay, so this, this lamb is blind and it keeps running into the fence post and it's not going to grow up and it's just, let's just offer him to the Lord. Well, what's going on there? Well, if I give this lamb, I only got one good lamb this year. If I give that to the Lord, and I mean, huh. But this is a, I mean, this is fine for sacrifice. He's blind. He's actually better as a sacrifice than as a lamb because he's blind. So you can see what's happening here is there's this domesticated view of God driving their worship that's going to say, you know what? Ugh, doing it the way God says is just too costly. And so I would rather, let's just, just offer this lamb. And he has to expose that to say, you're not honoring me. You're not respecting me. Would you honor that thing to the governor, to the, to, the, to the president, if he showed up at your house? Verse 9. But now, will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly Kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. I mean, the question here at this point in, the, in Malachi's sermon is, do you acknowledge your guilt? Do you acknowledge your guilt? Because he's sitting there saying, I just wish somebody would have a high enough view of me to say, I know we're supposed to go to the temple, but let's just at least shut the doors down because we think so poorly of God. Let's not keep insulting him by our ridiculous attempt at worship. That's what he's saying here. Just, would somebody think highly of me enough to just close the doors to the temple and stop insulting me? Verse 11, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered in my name, and a grain offering that is pure, for my name will be great among the nations. That's a promise. Verse 12, he begins to ask the question of the nation, is your obedience a burden? Is your obedience a burden? I mean, un, and mark it down, brothers and sisters. When obedience is a burden, you have domesticated God. When your obedience is, yeah, I'm not, obedience is not always easy. But when it's a burden, you understand the difference? Obedience is never easy. It costs you everything. And, um, but the question is, is it a burden? Is it worth the cost? Because even though it might be hard and there might be cost involved, it's always worth it. When the believer is thinking rightly about God, it's always worth it. What a privilege. It cost me everything, but I got to give God some more honor and glory. He's so worthy of that. But when he's not worthy of that, 
then we start going through these motions, and it's just like, oh, I'm so tired. It's just so hard, and I just want, and I just have to keep repenting, and then people keep asking me hard questions, and it's just, oh. But you are profaning my name in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, and you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand? This is when obedience becomes a burden. It becomes cumbersome. And the demands of the Lord are just a little too inconvenient. And mark it down. We've domesticated God when that happens. The mark of regeneration, according to 1 John 5, is when his commands are not burdensome. They might be difficult, but they're not a burden. They're a privilege. Finally, in verse 14, he asks the question, do you obey with shortcuts? Do you obey with shortcuts? Because if we obey with shortcuts, then we've domesticated God and we're thinking of him less than he is worthy of. Verse 14, but cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. And so here we have before us in God's word a clear path to honor God. No one knows how to honor God better than he does. No one knows how to honor God better than he does. And if we, have a, if we think rightly about God, we would humble ourselves and say, I don't even imagine that I can come up with a better way to, to honor God. I'm just going to do what he said. And when we start coming up with shortcuts from what he's actually said, then mark it down. We've become so arrogant to imagine that we know better what is going to please God and what's going to honor him. And now we have, in a religious context, domesticated him. And we're thinking about him less than he actually is. We domesticate God by viewing him as needy. We domesticate God by mixing our own desires with his. And next time, we will look at 2 Kings chapter 17 at the, um, the generation that was exiled to Assyria, and we will see how that generation viewed God as the dispenser of their own good. And they, they viewed their obedience to God as a means of getting personal gain. And that's, a, that's the last way we'll look at for how we domesticate God. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word, and Lord, we, I personally need this study. I'm so thankful that your word is the very cause of our fear of you, and um, probably pray this verse many times in this series, establish your word to your servant as that which produces fear of you. In your name we pray. Amen.